This session was originally going to be put on by our colleague, Krista. She is unwell and not able to do that it today. So today, John Tapper, our CEO and founder of All Learners Network, is going to be presenting um, some information about inclusion. So welcome, everybody. We will be, several of us are here from ALN. We'll be monitoring the chat. So um, just send anything in the chat that you're looking for. And John, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping that you can get to hear Chris to do this at some point. Um, I'm taking on the same topic from a slightly more math instructional point of view. Um, since there's only a few of us, which is honestly a wonderful privilege. Um, if you have questions, just put your hand up or throw something in the chat. Hey, Lily. Um, and uh, we'll we'll take it on. I'm hoping that we can have some discussion here today because this is a really interesting topic. Okay, so we're working on beyond inclusion today, and inclusion is one of my favorite topics. Um, this next slide here, this is a place where you can get the QR code for uh, today's slides. Also, though, I put on that Padlet a bunch of articles that uh, I wrote that are related to this topic. So, and HLCs, which are always on there, um, some stuff about the problem introduction protocol, it should be interesting. So we are in this game to cultivate a community of educators. You're here, thanks. And we wanna promote math equity and inclusion for all students because math is the gateway to so much opportunity. So we have some common agreements here. Um, we wanna have an open dialogue. I'm gonna try really hard to promote that for a variety of reasons, but mostly because that's where the learning comes. Um, we want you to be present. If you can keep your video on, that's great. You know, We understand there's times when you can't, but we'd like you to be active in this presentation. It's only an hour. And uh, we assume when you make comments that you have positive intention behind them, you are responsible for the things you say, but we want to engage you. We don't want to, uh, what, what does Ashley say? We want to call you in, not call you out. So these should be very familiar to all of you now. When you talk to your grandchildren about the great pandemic, you can tell them about how we used to do all this. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is to, I think we're going to talk as, well, maybe we'll have some smaller groups. What does it look like? What does it look like for every student to be included in a math class? So I'm going to send you to some breakout rooms. Okay. So in our conversation amongst the group, I heard a lot of people talk about how important inclusion was um, to the point where it seemed to me that inclusion was a real priority, even for students on IEPs and with disabilities. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you have some core instruction in your school that includes every single child, no exceptions? That is kind of remarkable. I am really happy about that. Okay, so what's the limit to inclusion? What's the limit to inclusion? Where do we say, well, okay, so we can handle a child that's having this kind of challenge or that kind of challenge or understands this or doesn't understand that. Where is the limit for that? Okay, so when I started working with the Vermont integration team, so that though, this is a team, every state has this, by the way. Just join this. Oh, great, thank you. Um, there is a team at a state level who is tasked with supporting schools and students and their families who have really complex needs, right? So in Vermont, for instance, there's 140. 30 some odd kids 
that are served by this committee, 32 of them are deaf and blind. Many of them have um, communication struggles or challenges. Um, we dealt with a, we helped support a student who could only move her eyes. Um, that was the level of her communication. So in your mind, where does, the, where's the line there where we say, we can't really include the students anymore? I was, I was thinking like, I don't know that there is a limit. I don't feel like there is a limit. It's like, but then how then do I support students with varied needs? I don't know that there's a limit, but then how do I do that? How do I provide that support? I love that question. Um, when we first started doing this, we had this, we were working in a bunch of different schools, trying out this idea for about all learners. And um, we had a fifth grade teacher contact us. And she said, look, I believe in all the stuff you're telling us, but I've got this kid operating at a second grade level in my fifth grade class. Like they can barely add and subtract. How are they supposed to deal with fractions? Which, you know, that's a legitimate question, right? We, we do have that. And as kids get into middle school and high school, that becomes a bigger issue. And so one of the questions that the group was kicking around that I introduced was, well, so do we have two main lessons? Do we have an adapted main lesson? And it's one of the few times that the people I dealt with got really angry with me. And one of the special educators on that group said, either all means all, or it doesn't. And, you know, of course, it, make, it chokes me up a little just to think about that now. Um, but at the same time, I said, so, but we don't have anything to offer, right? I mean, that's a legit question. And the group as a whole said, this relates exactly to what you said, Rowena. They said, just because we don't know how to do it now, doesn't mean it can't be done. And so in your class, if you have this disposition around inclusivity, around authenticity, around voice, that everybody's voice matters, then you don't say, well, I don't, you can say, I don't know how to do it, but the impulse is, so we're going to figure this out. For example, in our work with students with communication struggles, we created a um, number talk scoreboard. So we created, do you know what a core board is? Give me a thumbs up if you know what a core board is. Okay, so a core board for students who can't talk for a variety of reasons, it's a series of icons, usually on an iPad, that helps them communicate. There are 36 sort of core icons that allow someone to communicate at a basic level. So we did all this research around watching number talks and figuring out what are the most commonly used words or ideas and we created a number board that has the most common icons and the, the most commonly used, it only has 44 icons on it, most commonly used number talks icons so that a student could sit into in an additive number talk and um, participate. We also did some work around how to help teachers put one of those boards up in their class so that not just the kids with communication uh, struggles can use it, but other kids can use it. And it becomes a way for everybody to feel included and like their voice matters. And in one school in Middlebury, Vermont, they actually painted one of these communication boards on the playground so that kids could use it. Uh, uh, we used it with a bunch of schools. I don't remember the district at the moment, but we did paper versions mounted onto like a foam core so that it wasn't high tech, but kids could still point it at. And interestingly, some a school we worked with here in Burlington found that it was pretty useful for kids learning English as well as for kids who had some communication struggles. The point, though, is everybody, but not just everybody, everybody gets included. I can't tell you how many times in with ALN, we think we're communicating the idea that everybody's voice matters. And 
people think they're hearing that, but in their heads, they have this notion that it doesn't really apply to somebody else. I always say, but Charlotte, whoever the hell Charlotte is, right? We think, okay, yeah, but of course not her. So as we're thinking about exclusive inclusivity and voice and authenticity, we really are laying the groundwork for everybody, but everybody, but everybody. Just want to check the chat and be sure. Okay. Great. All right, let's head back and take another look. Uh, okay, so I just want to be sure I didn't skip one. Yes. Okay, so the question we get, like the question um, that we were talking about a minute ago, is how do we reach folks? How do we provide access? So um, one of the characteristics of inclusive teaching is that we, we want to find a way to provide access. So I love this particular example because it's a very, very simple look into a fourth grade lesson that was inclusive. So we were doing some work on an island in Maine and uh, it was a fourth grade group. And the class had all the special ed kids were taken out of the class. There were three of them. And so when we went into work there for a week, the we demanded, I don't think that's too strong a word, that all these children on IEPs had to be part of the process. And again, the teacher's question was, we're doing fractions, these kids, and you know you hear this regularly, can't do anything, which of course is never true. Even the kid who could only move her eyes could still do lots of interesting stuff, especially with the right technology. So I want you to think about this for a second. Writing an addition equation for seven eighths, you hopefully you have paper, front of you can think about it. I want you to write very quickly, write three addition equations for seven eighths. Okay. I know you can write a few more. I'm going to give you a second to write a few more. But imagine that you're a kid who doesn't have access to a great deal of knowledge about fractions. Um, what are, let's suppose I had seven because fraction understanding is always based on whole number understanding. Suppose I had seven somethings. Now remember, there's only a few of us in this room, so hopefully you won't be too shy. How could I break seven up into two or three pieces? What, what would the pieces look like? One and six. One and six is one. Stephanie or Kristen or Pat or Rose, any of you guys want to throw something in there? Sarah? Two, two, and three. Two, two, and three. Great. What else? Three and four. Three and four. Okay. So if I could break, if I could say three apples and four apples, three people and four people is seven people. Three dogs and four dogs is seven dogs. Then three eighths and four eighths must be, right? Okay, and what's the equation that kid is going to write who like suddenly has the, you know, you know the one I'm looking for. He wants to be tricky and fancy. Is it one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth? <laughs> yeah. So, so imagine we have this classroom and the main lesson for this class this day is decompose seven eighths. And what I say to the students in this class, to all the students in this class is put your best equation on the board. So some little person is going to go up there and put one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth and be like, now, what about the other kids in the class? who know the three eighths and four eighths and six eighths and one eighths, what could you say to them to stretch the problem so that they're getting a little bit of 
Could you ask them to find their problem in in the one eight plus one eight plus one eighth problem? Like, can you see if you did two eighths plus five eighths? Can you see two eighths plus five eighths in that problem? Oh, that's such an interesting question. Yes, I would usually do that during the interaction. Um, somebody who I missed just said, "Can you write four eighths a different way?" That's sort of what I was thinking. So what we would do is we would say to students, "Can you use two different denominators?" Can you use three different denominators, right? So here's where the voice and authenticity comes in. The board is full of these equations. Who did the work there, right? It wasn't me showing all the clever things that are up there. It all came from the students. So then what's my job? So I'm going to paint a little picture for you here. We have some some examples to see. But when I was I, I was over in Japan studying elementary uh, math over there, and I was in this first grade classroom for a while, and they had this amazing whiteboard. Um, it went one entire wall, and the teacher would give the kids a problem, and. I have to say, I had some questions because he never like wrote the problem. He would just say it to them. So obviously there's some issues. And remember, this is Japan. So he's got like 40 kids in his class. So he would give the kids the problem. And then he would say to them, okay, think about it. And that was like my favorite moment in the whole lesson because they would get their thinking faces. And then after about a minute of quiet thinking time, he would say, go. And it was like a bomb went off. Kids would pull their desks together. Some kids would pull their desks apart. And they would do all this thinking about the problem. And he would walk around with a handful of markers. And he would press this little button on the whiteboard. There's a reason I'm telling you all this. And the whiteboard would come down to kid level. And then as he walked around, he would give out markers and the kids would go up there and put their work on the board. And then this is where you knew you were in Japan and not in the United States. He would just say, okay, kids. And they would all like back to their seats, trying to get the kids back from an activity like that. I always felt like I'm on, the sh I'm on a ship in a storm, you know, like I need a whip and a chair and the whole thing. But Japanese kids just... So then he presses the button again and the whiteboard goes up so everyone can see it. And he spends the rest of the lesson asking kids to talk about what they've put up there and make connections between their work and other work. And as I watched him over time, I realized he had this incredible ability for seeing like the simplest sort of things moving toward the complex, like how he chose is really interesting. So. All the voices were up there. They were doing real work. Same with the decomposed seven eighths problem. All the stuff's up there. And now our job is to get the kids to talk about it. And the place where we help them make conceptual leaps is by asking them questions like, how is what you're doing like this other thing I see here? Or someone said one fourth plus five eighths. Why did they say one fourth? So that the actual work, again, is coming from what the students are doing. So in order to get this inclusion piece happening, you have to have the two parts. You have to have a task that everyone has access to and then there has to be built-in conversation, voice. There has to be authentic student voice. And authenticity is important here because kids can mimic, kids generally do mimic what the teacher is telling them. That is not real learning. And we're, we're going to investigate that in just a sec. Anyone make a comment before I head back to the slide deck? Because I can't see you once I'm sharing my screen.
Okay, remember, anytime you have something to say, just let us know. All right, so I'm gonna show you a couple of videos here. Yeah, we're good. Um, they each represent a particular kind of teaching and I wanna spend some time unpacking that. I want you all to type into the chat um, something you noticed about those two lessons that was similar. What was the same instructionally? Maybe it's a belief, maybe it's a technique. What was similar about those two lessons? Both had visuals. Okay, I would say models. They both use conceptual models, visual models, yep. Focusing on addition using some kind of object. Okay, so it wasn't entirely abstract. Showed several rays of solving. Okay, so that's really interesting, Pat. Um, would you feel comfortable coming on and saying a little more about that? Well, I mean, in the, in the first one, um, it was all digital, but they put up the fruits and vegetables and counted them, and then they did the same thing along a number line. So there's a couple of different ways there. I do want to jump off something Pat said. So he's right. There were multiple strategies in both the first and the second video. So again, back to the chat here. How were they different? How were those multiple strategies different in the first video and the second video? The second was led by the students. Where is Chris? Let's get some more on there. Oh, there you are. One was I do, the other was you do. Well, you know that um, we were talking about this, uh, Sarah and I. A lot of um, a lot of colleges teach I do, we do, you do, right? Student strategies versus teacher strategies. Students actively participate. The first one was an explanation, student input. Okay, so this notion about where the strategies come from. Where do the strategies come from? Melody, did you want to say something? I noticed you unmuted. <laughs> um, well, no, I didn't mute, I think. Um, oh, but okay. that whole, uh, you do, we do or however I do, that's a very Japanese oriented thing. So <laughs> I was making that connection when you were saying that. So it's called, the, the technique is gradual release. And I would say this is the overwhelming model that people have for education. The teacher shows you, then you do it together. Then the student does it independently. But this is really, here we are at 418. This is really the heart of everything we want to talk about today. Because are the students doing their own thinking? What subject would we accept students have to mimic teacher thinking? Now, I know there are places and there are schools where that's an expectation. But in general, we value independent thinking except in mathematics. So uh, some statistics that are related directly to this. So the overwhelming instructional strategy throughout the United States is the teacher shows you how to do it. You do it a hundred times and then you know how to do it. So that instructional strategy leads to math proficiency for about 50% of fourth grade students. This is a very robust statistic from Nate for years and years. And wait for it, guess the racial and socioeconomic makeup of that 50% of students. Yeah, they're white middle-class kids. So 
there, there, that's not an uh, anomaly, right? Because if I'm telling you how to think, the more you look like me, the easier it is for you to understand how to think like me. 75% of the teachers in the United States are white middle-class people. So is it a surprise that the majority of students who are proficient in mathematics using this teaching technique are white middle-class kids? Now, once I pose the problem the way we did in the number talk, does it depend on the teacher? Somebody said right here, student input, asking how do you see that, um, led by the students using different strategies. The strategy comes from the student. So the voice, the authenticity, the work is being done by the student. And that's why this is such a critical issue. Many, 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 many uh, supervisors would watch a lesson like the Sal Khan lesson and say, oh, my goodness, look at what he's doing. He's got some models up there. He's going, he's explaining carefully. And the kids who look like and sound like him are going to have a much bigger advantage toward understanding that. Whereas here are, here is six and here's eight. What do you see is an entirely different approach to this because it demands that the students bring their own voice, their own authenticity, their own thinking to the task. Okay, just take a couple of more. Yeah, to, to my way of thinking, actually, to all learners, which I suppose is mostly my way of thinking, this instructional approach is the heart of student voice belonging authenticity. I don't know why there's a white screen there. Oh. We talk a lot about belonging, by the way. And sometimes people make light of the notion that a student belongs in a class. And that's always a miscalculation, even up into middle school and high school, because belonging is about being willing to take a risk, to use your thinking, to have your thinking be revised. So I want to ask some questions, four questions here as we're getting toward the end. Whose voice is the most important for learning? I know what the answer is generally but I'm hoping that your answer to that question is changing as a result of some of the things we've talked about. Who needs to feel comfortable? This is such an interesting question because schools are set up in such a way that the kids have to be ready for school. The kids have to meet the expectation for school. Most of the time, even when there's an intention, the schools are not ready for the kids because it's the kids that need to feel like they belong, that they're, what they have to say counts, that they can make mistakes in math class. If they have to be right, it makes it really hard to learn mathematics. In fact, we have a, con we have a question we often pose in all learners, who is the math for? This becomes a really important question in seventh and eighth grade. Because a lot of seventh graders think that math is the thing that teachers do to them because they don't like them very much, rather than the notion that math is something that's actually for the kids. So what I really want you to take away and think about is how do we shift what we're doing right now to the idea that the student voices, the student strategies, the stu who the students are becomes the focus of the instruction. And then how can we make that usable? How is it actually useful?